Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Revenue Growth Architects podcast with Charlie and Chrissy here from CST. We've got a pretty fun agenda today. We're going to go through the same segments that we did last week. So first off, we're going to break down something that we're seeing in go-to-market ops. Um, that's a very important topic that hopefully everyone can learn from. The second segment, we're going to bring back GTM or GTFO. So I've got a video that I'm going to share with Christy and I'm going to get her reaction and see if she likes it or not. And then the third is questions for CS2. So the first topic that we're going to dig into is all around attribution credit and playing the attribution credit game and is data the issue or is culture the issue? And the last question, just to give you a little teaser, it's all around, is it called pipeline? Is it called lifecycle? Is it called funnel? When does pipeline start? You know, I don't know. Let's see if we can figure it out by the end of this podcast. So let's dig into this first part. Now, uh, a bit of a bit of backstory here. So do you think that people that listen to our podcast are tired of the word attribution? <laughs> probably. But it is our most best performing episodes anyway. So I think it's I don't think you can get enough attribution in your life when you're in good market. That could be true. Um I mean, write in and tell us if you hate us talking about attribution and maybe we'll stop. I think the main, the, pro- the problem is, right, it's just so um, heavily debated. Polarizing. Both on pu- in public forums yeah. and then also in behind the scenes within companies, right? Yeah. And there's, there's a reason why we debate it so much here because it's not a simple do X and everyone's going to be happy, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot of stuff that you need to try and figure out. And that's a bit of what we're going to talk about today. So just to set the scene. Now, um, when it comes to attribution, there is attribution data and there is how you use the attribution data. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that we really want to break down today and really try and give our perspective on because so much we hear. We hear this from clients. We hear this on LinkedIn. We hear this at events. We hear this all over the place. Attribution data is the problem. It's like, oh, you're, you're doing multi-touch attribution, you're tracking all the touch points, and that's a problem. You're going to argue over credit or like what gets the percentage of, of the attribution. Oh, you're tracking the funnel and you're trying to try, tie that back to one particular source. You know, that data is yeah. the problem. It's going to I make people argue. I think we should do argue. first touch. I think we should do last touch. I think we should just, yeah. And it always comes down to, okay, we're, you're, you're going to set up this tracking, Mm -hmm. you're going to get this data and that's going to create division and arguments and a bad culture when it comes to credit. So Chrissy, maybe I want to get your take on this because is the attribution data the problem or is there, I mean, I know where we're going to go with this already, obviously, but like, what do you think? Is there something else that maybe is at play here? Well, I think actually there's two things because your attribution data can be a problem. But I think what people think is like there's this silver bullet of like figuring out the right attribution, mainly for them with the goal of like proving marketing, proving sales, trying to give credit. Um, And usually it's tied back to goals because they're like, oh, we need to actually be able to attribute what team drove this level of pipeline. And I think it's not in that case you can get the data to be as perfect which we all know is not possible to be as perfect as possible and you give those teams that data they're still going to find issues with it they're going to find like oh that partner deal well marketing started emailing that person like you know a year ago and they attended a webinar but then the partner sent the deal referral over um You know, there's going to be cases where a sales outbound starts a a funnel and that person also did a marketing activity maybe six months prior. They're not going to get the credit. People are going to find issues. Um, Also, depending on the model that you use, um, it can not show you certain channels that maybe some people are also heavily tied to from a goal perspective, especially like field marketers and whatnot. And so we talk about attribution a lot. We talk about funnel attribution, which we suggest the tipping point. We talk about multi-touch attribution. Those methodologies for attribution are good. And we can tell people how to set up the data the right way. But I think where everyone's like, missed, like 
you know, assumptions that attribution is bad or attribution is wrong or their data is wrong is actually because it's not telling them the story that they want or it's not giving their team the credit that they feel like they deserve or need or need to keep their job right yeah and i think um depending on the size of the organization too or how you know j- let's be honest if you're a, a early stage startup and you're in marketing and you're a cmo that say just started 3 months ago there it's not going the it's not going to look good for them Pipeline numbers are are mainly going to be tied to sales. A lot of stuff isn't going to be tied to their marketing programs because they haven't had time. It's a lagging indicator. We talk about this a lot. And also they haven't even built up a program or any type of marketing or any type of brand. And we see this a lot. And then that, that CMO panics, right? And then the CEO is like, where's all the pipeline? Like we hired you for a reason. Uh, and then that creates like more stress, which then trickles down to their team, which makes them start doing things that isn't good, good marketing, um, just to try and surface up some pipeline right away. And so I think that's the case too, where people don't realize it's not really the data. It's just the nature of what happens with like creating uh, revenue. <laughs> like it's just, we need to use our noggins a bit more, but I think also there needs to be a little bit of education. And also we have like very high, not standards, but I think we have these assumptions from every team about like how things should be, how things should look. And that's coming down from maybe past history or I don't know what it is, but I feel like it's not, it's never usually the data or the data structure. It's always just the people using it and they're using it wrong. Yeah. I mean, like you said, at the beginning, the data can be set up wrong, right? But like, can, yeah. assuming it's, it's not, and you think about kind of what I was mentioning at the beginning, this like the different, like different types, like you've got, you know, you're trying to try back to like a single touch, like a final tipping point kind of thing, or you have the multi-touch. Now, people, the people on both sides of those will say, like, the other side can be used for the credit game, like, even more. Like, for example, with multi touch, I've been in hours of meetings where people are like, why did this touch point get 5% of this opportunity and not 25% of this opportunity, right? With yeah. the funnel attribution, it's, it's a similar thing, but maybe it's a little bit more simple because it's like, okay, well, this opportunity got 100% from you know this marketing channel but then sales things they got went outbound or partner whatever kind of like what you're talking about mm-hmm. now they both have the potential for you to get into that meeting and just go down a rabbit hole and just debate over what should have got the credit mm-hmm. now that has nothing to do with the the issues with the data right like george box said i say this over and over again that the statistician every model is wrong but some are useful yeah and if you go in with that mentality where this is not perfect, this is wrong in many ways, but it's right enough that we're going to be able to get some insight out of this, then you're not going to hopefully get into that um, battleground where you're trying to get the perfect source or the perfect multi-touch distribution across the touch points related to the opportunity. But a lot of that issue starts with um, the culture, uh-huh. right? If the CEO and the CRO and the CMO and the parking a partner lead, parketing, <laughs> maybe that should be what partner partner marketing should be parketing. Yeah, that's partner marketing. I just invented a new word. <laughs> if <laughs> if uh, if they're all fighting over other things, and then the culture is to fight against over attribution, yeah, they're going to find a way to look at the data and fight over it. Mm-hmm. But if everyone does realize this is a team sport. We're all in this together and we're setting up these models to help us improve and Mm -hmm. help us understand, you know, hopefully what is generating pipelines so we can do a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that and optimize over time. Yeah. Then the data isn't going to lead you down this credit, credit battle. Totally. But it's not the data's fault. The data is just the data. Mm -hmm. It's how you use it that creates the drama. Yeah. And like with this data because it's never going to be perfect like think about just like how buyers buy think about you know 
I think recently I bought like a new protein powder, right? I first heard, I first saw something about it like on social from someone. They had like a discount code. I kind of like noodled on it. Then they, that brand started like texting me. We're like, oh, why don't you use this discount code? It was better than the one that the other like influencer had. I used it. Like they're going to look at giving attribution to me back to like that text or whatever. But really where I first heard about it. But that thing is the reason why I ended up purchasing two bags, not just one. Because I was like, oh, I'm going to get more of a discount. And so what you want to do is track both those things, right? If you can. Um, But you have to know that like it's not perfect. There's probably that that's a very simple thing. I can actually tie those two behaviors together. But there's so many other things that can play a role into decision making. It's not so like linear in that way. It's, and so we're just trying to do our best. And some people I've in the past thought, okay, well, this data can be used almost like a compass to tell you, like, are you on the right path with your marketing or you not or like a map? I think it's more even just like you are using like a modern car and they tell you when, you know, you're out of, like, you could get into a car crash or something's in the way or something like you just, it's more to give your team nudges on. I was like, going to use the term nudge as well. Yeah. You know, like a nudge. I'm like, this is this is good. Like, keep doing this. Also, what's not there, and what's not in the data, and you get you. There's been enough time from those channels and experiments where you should have seen pipeline already. That's enough to say, like, okay, maybe that doesn't work out for us, or maybe we just need to adjust. Um, so, what's your take on um, if? So one of the reasons why we ended up having this chat today is because I got into a good conversation slash debate with someone around um, if you do some kind of like pipeline attribution, funnel attribution model, and you're tying that back to the tipping point, Mm -hmm. there are tipping point types, right? There's kind of tipping points that come from marketing. There's tipping points that come from sales. There's tipping points that come from partner. Mm -hmm. And their point of view was that if you think about it this way, you're just it's a recipe for an argument between those teams. My point of view was we need to think about it that way because each of those tipping point types requires you know, different operations mm-hmm. and different ways of tracking. And so we need to identify them so we know how to track the data. Yeah. And then by identifying them, you know, we want to be able to label, you know, if, if we're using like our custom object, for example, each custom object record based on the tipping point type so we know. Um, but then it's down to the company whether they use that to kind of pit the teams against each other. So what's your take on that? Do you just not track that? No. Because then you, like, <laughs> you do if you track take, it. If you take that to its logical extreme, then you shouldn't track any right. tipping yeah, point six, I think... right? Because you could still, my point was like, if, you, if you've got a tipping point of marketing, sales, whatever, yeah, maybe you take out the label marketing sales, but like level, level down, you're still looking at yeah. what type of marketing channel it was or what type of outbound it was. So you can still figure it out so you'd have to take out that layer too you literally have to have no tipping point source back to that 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 final or pipeline is yeah. that, is that, do you agree with that no like, i don't not, agree. No, do you agree with me saying like well that's not the right way of going about it you should still just have it and just make yeah sure you should still just have it and the reason why i think that is because one if you don't do it that way you're missing out on a huge part of your pipeline that you're not like tracking properly or the same way what you want is a unified data model and approach. I think also people need to realize, and this is my tip, I think for some people who maybe own like the analytics is think about even not showing all the data to all the teams in one format, like try and even build Mm -hmm. out reporting and dashboards for like the different groups. So show sales, you know, how many outbound funnels they started What's the conversion rate? How has that changed over time, especially since they've implemented things? Tie the cadence or um, sequence name to the funnel and see, like, dig into, are there certain ones that are, you know, helping with velocity? Same way with field marketing. You maybe are going to focus more on multi-touch attribution data and not so much first touch, but maybe show them first touch for some of their channels. And then separately, you maybe have, like, your demand gen team. And then customer marketing as well. They have programs, too. And I didn't, I've done this in, in past because I was in one org where everyone was comfortable viewing everything at the same time because they knew we all had like our hands in the pot and it was, it was fine. I went to a, the next org and people were 
fighting over credit and attribution. And then some people were feeling like their channels were looking you bad. You wouldn't say which orgs? <laughs> Mar Marquetta was the good one. I'll say his. <laughs> I think I know which one <laughs> might be the one. Where there's really um, Maybe and, I work there as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not CS2, by the way. Well, the before. interesting thing is Marquetta, I think, ended up going down that path a little bit. And so this is what I'm saying. Like, I think it comes down from an executive standpoint, too, like you mentioned. Um, but It's all about the, yeah, the cultural. The side. culture, yeah. And every time I hit an org where it was like, Okay, it's 40, 40, 20, pipeline creation, 40 from marketing, 40 from sales, 20 from partner. Like that is like a recipe for disaster, 100%. Do not do that. So what do you do though? So this is the bit where maybe I'm, I'm still trying to perfect my, my point of view because I agree you don't, you like the data is going to be there, right? You're going to be able to say whether it's 40% marketing, 40% yeah. sales, 20% partner. And so if you're able to say that, then one side of the argument is like, well, okay, yeah, well, you know, let's set, we want to be able to goal set, right? Yeah. To be able to drive the right behavior. Or hold people accountable. Hold people accountable. Yeah. Um, and therefore, we have a total pipeline target, right? So even if you don't call it 40, 40, 20, you call it marketing. We've got a $100 million pipeline goal. Marketing, I wanted to get 40, sales 40, partner 20. Everyone still knows that's the percentage, and then they're going to be like, "Well, why did that opt to go to sales, and why didn't it go to marketing?" How do you get around that? Well, I I almost think of it as like almost like a, a family. Like if one person is not, and I've I've been feeling this a lot, like kind of like a Thanksgiving, like you bring the turkey, I'll bring the. <laughs> well, right. Like if turkeys. you just give them all one goal, it's like okay, today, family, our goal is to like get to the beach, right? Okay, you know this that some get too real now. You know that some people, <laughs> you know that there's like some people that maybe are kind of like struggle a bit more to get everything ready to go to the beach. But if they Is that person five years old, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then others where it maybe needs a little bit less lift, um, and then the getting ready happens like right at the end. That's like almost like a partner, right? But I would then know, okay. In order for us all to get to the beach, though, we need to, like, contribute. And so in some ways, if they all just have a shared goal, if they don't make it there, if they don't all make, you know, if they don't hit that goal to get to the beach, like, no one wins in some cases. And the reason why I think that that's good is that no one's, like, leaning on their laurels for someone else to maybe also hit that goal. But also they're thinking about, okay, how can I make partners successful? How can I still support sales to do outbound in a more effective way and then how can i make our marketing great um and then alternatively like how can i make marketing great if i'm on the sales side like how can i really take their leads that they've followed uh, you know generate for us and, and bring them down funnel and that is better if you want to have like general like ideas of planning where your pipeline is going to come from i think that that is fair but i think when you when you're tying too much of this like okay, if all of marketing, if all of, this, if everyone doesn't hit the goal, but marketing hits their goal and they get, they get comped on that, but then like partner doesn't, cause maybe they hit like 19%. That's what I don't agree with because I think it's like in those individualized goals, everyone's just going to get to their goal. They're not going to care about whether everyone else did. And so you need to just think about like people and behavior and stuff like that. And so um, it should just still be a shared goal. Yes, you can say, okay, realistically, we're going to plan for you're likely only going to get 20% of the pipeline. Do that. Do that. That's fine. But it still should be, okay, but we're all not going to get bonused unless we all hit the same goal. Yeah. Everyone has to be in it together. It's kind of like a, a win or lose together yeah. situation. Create that. I also think um, the trend, which has gone back and forth since we've been in in this world over the last 14 years but like i like sdrs as part of marketing me too because then at least you you've at least eliminated one division point yeah because it's like well sdrs you know you've got a pipeline target of 10 million marketing you've got a pipeline target of 30 million and it's like well marketing is like well i need sdrs to follow up on my the, my buyers and i'm bringing them 
But the SDRs are like, well, no, I just want to go outbound and bring my own ones in. So they're part of marketing. They've got a shared goal. I think that definitely is a very practical way to eliminate some division there. Mm-hmm. It also helps because the sales team, you know, the sales team are getting comped on commission, right, for selling deals. Mm-hmm. And they don't give a shit, like, really where those deals come from. They're going to work the deal that's going to close, right? right? So for them, it's like, go, just go for it. Yeah, like, maybe you want them to do some outbound and there's some, um, you know, you, you want to encourage them to do that. But like if if they're crushing their goals, right, or they're all and and it's all just coming from inbound or from the marketing and SDR pipe or the pipeline, uh, the partner pipe, and they're so busy, your sales team is just maxed out with all of those deals. Do you need them to do outbound? No, that's I totally agree with that. So so you know you don't necessarily need sales to have okay a forty yeah. percent outbound only target if they're crushing no. all of the all of the opportunities that are coming to them from everywhere else. And then partner, generally, you know, you can think of that slightly outside of the marketing context because a lot of the deals that come through partners, it's so like relationship based. It, I think it's a bit more clear cut. So anyway, there, there's a few kind of ideas, but ultimately, you know, the data is the data. Use it the right way to not sow division within your team. But yes. really, it starts from the cultural top down. It doesn't start from the data going up. Yeah. So let's move on to the next section. Is this is this, this is the GTM or GTFO section. I've got a video that I'm going to share with Chrissy. She hasn't seen it before. Get her reaction and see um, if she thinks this guy is right or not. All right. So before I get into it, this guy, his name is Rory Sutherland, a nice uh, British advertising executive. Um, uh, somehow, like my YouTube algorithm, just like has just been funneling his content at me for in the last month. And he always has very, in my opinion, the kind of insightful thing, the things to say. Um, and, but yeah, you know, I want to get your take on, on this particular part. So I'm going to play like the first, uh, I think like 30 seconds and then ask you a question. I'm Rory Sutherland and I'm on Help Bank. And I'm going to answer a series of questions. The first one is, what is the biggest marketing lie? The biggest marketing lie is that marketing is a cost. Once you frame marketing as a cost, you've got the wrong mindset. Marketing is a way of avoiding opportunity cost. It's completely wrong to frame it that way. The second biggest lie is that you should only do marketing when it's completely measurable or accountable or quantifiable, because that's simply setting the bar too high, and a lot of very valuable things you can do to distinguish yourself are rendered impossible by that rule. Don't follow that rule. Measure what you can, but don't demand that you measure everything. That's simply a limitation all right so there's two parts to that there's like the marketing shouldn't be seen as a cost but then the bit that i really wanted to get your take on was the you shouldn't measure everything but so what do you think gtm or gtfo you can talk about it first before you decide it's all well one side note why is he holding on to his face like this the whole time because his he's so (laughs) thoughtful he's I don't know. His, he has to keep his brain inside his head. Yeah, you need character. Um, so I think GTM and bold <laughs> um, for that. I think that it's so true. Like one, I think also the thing that's really helped me think about this is just like running a business. Um, and if you, I mean, the good thing for us is we don't have investors. We don't have like loads of money either. And our goals probably aren't super high. But when you don't have those pressures to think about, okay, what is the, what am I getting out of this like channel? You just have to get a general sense for like, is it good? You know, am I doing good marketing? Am am I doing the purpose of what marketing needs to be? Then I think that that should be your way of thinking. And I do think that, yes, you want, I agree with him. Like you want to measure what you can, but you don't have to demand measurement for everything. And like, that's so true. And I wish like all CEOs and boards thought that way. Um, and enlisted a bit more trust. Now you don't want to just like not track anything. Yeah. It then, can, the pendulum can swing too far the other way. Yeah. Um, And if you're just doing things like willy nilly, you know, like recently it was a, it was an insightful thing for me too, where 
I have with like my fitness, I was like, okay, I haven't, I've always just kind of done what I kind of wanted to do. I did like, I always wanted like irregularity, keep things fun. Let me just do this random strength workout, this and that. And then recently I've done more of like a regimented program, which is not groundbreaking. Like people do it all the time, like split training. And I've been specifically like focusing on my recovery day, da, da, da. And then also nutrition. Okay, I have a goal set. I want to hit this amount of protein per day. Where I, before I was just like, okay, I'm just going to eat healthy. That was just my thing. Um, so I wasn't really, that's like to me, random acts of like marketing and for, for sake and not tracking anything. And then I think for, so you don't want to go on that track. But if you put some parameters in place, you have a goal, you you get a program running that you can then also give some room for some experimentation, but still do the things that you know really works well, then that to me is great go to market because um, it should include sales and customer success and so forth anyway. But um, yeah, so I mean, I agree. <laughs> It's pretty undeniable, isn't it? I mean, I think a lot of people have cottoned onto this over the last few years. There's plenty of stuff that you can't measure. Especially now. And usually it's the good stuff. Yeah, it's usually it's the usually good stuff. It's usually the really That's good the stuff. Like Do you think there's kind of a correlation between uh, difficulty to measure versus uh, kind of the power and engagement level of a certain channel? I think there's like probably somewhat of a correlation there. Um, but, you know, whether even if that's not true there's still plenty of the buyer's journey that isn't measurable and if you i think his his main point that i really liked is that if you demand that measurement then you're shooting yourself in the foot mm -hmm. so definitely gtm from my point of view yeah too. and i think they're like what we're usually measuring especially from a funnel attribution standpoint which i guess kind of relates to the last segment is more around like where you capturing that demand where is it showing up and then you're sending it over to sales but there's a lot of activities that go into creating demand and a lot of those are really hard to track but you still want to do them yeah i think the the other thing is so i heard someone on linkedin recently talk about how um his point was like uh you can actually measure everything and it's kind of a cop out if you don't and i think i responded i was like well you know, well, first of all, I don't think you can measure everything. Mm -hmm. I think there probably is more than people can. There's where some people where his where his point might be right is that there's some people that think, well, that's too difficult to measure. I'm not going to measure it. Mm -hmm. So maybe they can measure more. But there is a law of diminishing returns, I think, when it comes to measurement where, OK, I could try and measure this thing. But actually, is it doing more harm than good? Yeah. Right. So I think and and it's costing me a lot of money to measure this like one edge case here or I'm just getting too data hungry. And I, I think this usually comes in the form of like not particularly tracking the marketing touch points. I think more of it is tracking maybe some of the sales stuff. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I, companies are like, I want to get, you know, an app like how many sales touch points happened at this stage of the buyer's journey and how many sales touch points that and then what type of meeting did this and it's like okay are you going to use this data okay that's and, and, but like you have to do like they've got like 25 lead statuses for like every yeah. every step of the sdr process and it's like okay well no one's following that no no one's doing it for one two if you do they're going to be so inefficient in their job that you know they're, they're stopped from selling and but now you can measure this thing so I think that there's definitely some areas where you need to think, but, one, yeah. is this worth it? Yeah. Like, is this actually worth yeah. to measure? And I think there's a lot of cases. I think actually. anecdotally too, we've like moved with persistence from the client requesting it. We've done some of that tracking and the more granular, like you'd be surprised, and that doesn't get used. Never use it, yeah. We always like check in, oh, how is that like, and then you go back to that dashboard, it's like, hasn't been refreshed hasn't been since refreshed. 2001. Like, yeah, 300 <laughs> days, and you're like, but you wanted that granularity, and you mm. really pushed for it. So I think we need to think about data as being something that will actually be used as well, and not just the sake of like more and more data. Because honestly, the more and more data you provide your team, the more confusing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like overwhelming, confusing. And data for data sake never works. Yeah. 
But one thing I will say on the measurement side is you want to marry someone who understands how the data, a measurement is being done. And then with the person. You want to marry marry someone? Well, you want to marry. You want to marry them together. But you also need the people in the room that worked on those programs, which is why I was like, okay, maybe to start, especially if we credit gain, like show the data to those individual teams and have really good conversations around the data. Cause that's the whole point. You want to take the data, create action, take the data, create action. And actually, yeah. So piggybacking on that. One way to think about reporting is it's not just reporting, right? That it, I've talked about this before. There's like the iceberg under the surface. Yes. So every report you're trying to get, yeah. There is a lot of operations and process and training and enabling and stuff that has to happen for that report to work. Yeah. So be careful about what reports you're trying to create because you're creating a lot of big icebergs out there, right? <laughs> yeah. And you're on the Titanic and you're like, okay, I'm dodging all these icebergs uh, of reporting and I'm one person in marketing ops and I'm, I've got to now service all these reports, not to mention train everyone how to use the reports and create different pivot t- pivots on those reports yeah. and Everything. So or the automation for some. It's like a, it's like a tool, right? Every yeah. time you implement a new tool, it's not reducing your workload; it's no. adding to it. Every time you create a new report type or a new way of tracking, it's adding a lot more work onto your place. So be careful of what you wish for. Yeah. All right. Next up. So questions for CS two. So, um, this was a question um, that was was posed in a LinkedIn thread on someone else's post where we we were t- it. It was the original post was around how funnel. It wasn't like funnels are dead, but it was along those lines. It's like funnels are stupid. You know, it's an old way of looking at things. The buyer's journey is more complex. And so, to give everyone a bit of a background, me and Chrissy, we agree with with this mostly, and we've always struggled. And Chrissy, you had a post about this recently. When we think about tracking kind of the sales process funnel, right? Like sales ready meeting pipeline one. Um, what do you call that? Is it life cycle? You know, when back in the day with Marketo, you had like the life cycle modeler and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, revenue do you call cycle. It revenue cycle. Like, mm-hmm. do you call it pipeline? Do you call it um, the funnel? And um, recently we've been calling it funnel, but I think the the question was... Waterfall? Yeah, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Bowtie funnel, like basically, it, it, it's an interesting question. Like, what kind of what do you call this? Um, and I think our point of view is like slowly evolving. And when we think about um, you know this question of like what is the right terminology for this, and like what are some of the nuances that kind of lead you towards calling it something? It's like, and maybe you take this question. It's like, what do you? What is the perfect term that? M- the majority of people can understand intuitively. Uh, and maybe the last thing I'll say on this is that a lot of people get confused with funnel because in this post was not even talking about this sales funnel. I was talking about like, okay, someone fills out a form and then you send them a piece of content and kind of you think you know where they are in the buyer's journey by putting them through this like content experience funnel. Um, so yeah, what if, if what is a better term? Like what is the right way of thinking about like what we think of as the something that starts with sales ready? Um, so, well, I think ba- we had a conversation on it. So I feel like I've maybe been like swayed in a little bit direction. I think before that I was kind of still like using life cycle because it implied that there was like, you know, you go through it again and you'd have another journey. Then I was like journey. Okay. It's more of a buyer's journey and how we're measuring that. Um, but I think when we talked about using the term pipeline, that's something also that that interests me, especially when you think about, okay, if we think about a pipeline only starting once that's hit like marketing forecast, that's too late. That's almost like you're like sales forecast, sorry, sales forecast. Yeah. And so, but for us, when we think of things, you want to measure it for once it becomes sales ready. And that could also include not just being sales ready from marketing, but sales saying something's ready, they're going to start a funnel or a partner saying something is ready for sales, right? Basically, this is ready to be prosecuted, right? Um, and so when we think about that, okay, maybe it's the that pipeline actually starts there. Yes, it doesn't have a dollar amount tied to it. It's maybe not in a sales forecast. But that's when things start happening, right? You start moving into 
working, you know, someone's following up, then they're booking a meeting and, and so forth. And so when you posted, it was like, oh, should this be called a pipeline? You know, and I was like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Because when you think about it, too. So when we tie attribution, funnel attribution, we'll call it that. But in this case, pipeline attribution, <laughs> in some ways, the we're saying, what was that tipping point? Like, where did it start? What was like that entry point to to start it? And we, you gave the example of like an oil like mine. Okay, yes, there that oil could have came from somewhere else, and maybe don't exactly know know exactly where, but where it actually entered that pipeline to hit the end goal was there. And you can, yes, it might go different directions and whatnot, but you also have an end goal of like close one. So I like in my head, I'm like, oh, I like that as pipeline, but it doesn't start that late. And I think that also ties better to a buyer's journey and how we want to service that buyer. Because by the time now they become sales ready, it's probably more or less likely the same way that someone was when they hit into a forecasted opportunity back in the day, just because so many people are doing their research earlier and they have an idea of whether they want to buy before they're even talking to someone. And that's why I think it's important to measure that, measure it earlier and measure it when they start, you know, getting sent over to sales. And then, um, so yeah, so I mean, I like pipeline and I like, um, I think that when we think about pipeline though, we have to be mindful that some people think of pipeline of like, do you have a dollar amount tied to an opportunity? Um, is it past it 0%? Is it in your forecast? And to me, that feels like forecast. And also I've realized recently, like, it is a bit tough to just say, oh, enter a dollar amount so early. Like, sometimes people don't even think opportunities are real unless they have a dollar amount. And for me, I've been selling recently. I'm like, if we're waiting for that point, you're way too effing late, you know, way too late. Yeah. So I, the thing I liked about funnel is that it, it implies a, a conversion rate and like less people make it to the next stage. Yeah. Um, but the th problem with funnel is that there's so many different uses of it. Yeah. It's not language that sales speaks. It's not language that the CEO speaks or investors particularly speak in, maybe some. Everyone talks about pipeline. Mm -hmm. Everyone think, knows what pipeline or has an idea of what pipeline is that it's important we need more of it <laughs> uh and that is the language the nuance that i think that we are bringing to this is that pipeline shouldn't if we're thinking about relabeling funnel to pipeline pipeline doesn't start when there is an opportunity with a dollar amount like you talked about mm -hmm. pipeline should start at the sales ready point at that handoff to sdr bdr so then we can track it all the way through and we know where did that pipeline come from at that stage at the tipping point. And then we can see what are the conversion rates all the way through and not just like the win rate or the opportunity from forecast. Yeah. And that gives you just more insight. And I really like that as a label and a way of thinking about it because at least with pipeline, when you think about it compared to funnel, if you misunderstand what I'm talking about there, if when I say the word pipeline and you only think about kind of, okay, it's in forecast, there's a dollar amount, there's an opportunity in Salesforce, whatever. Fine. You know, you're still in the ballpark of what I'm talking about um, because that's the important part. It's a really important part of, you know, the, the pipeline process. If you misunderstand what I'm talking about with funnel and you think, oh, there's like anonymous people who convert on the website and then get into kind of our gated asset or whatever funnel. That is so far away from what we're talking about when we talk about funnel mm -hmm. that if if I had to choose like which version of misunderstanding I have to choose, I would choose the, the pipeline one. So I think we should start thinking about this tipping point sales ready to close one process as pipeline and really try and educate people on pipeline. The pipeline doesn't just start that late in mm -hmm. an opportunity cycle it starts when and the handover to sdr and we want to track conversion rates from that point onwards and i think that and then just the fact that it's it's pipeline and it's kind of a typical kind of sales um word 
I think that just gets sales on board. Like we're creating pipeline for you, right? We're not sending you MQLs. We're creating pipeline for you. It's like, or, you know, we're, it's aligning marketing SDR and sales around creating pipeline, not just funnels or life cycles. You know? Yeah. So I, I, I like it. I like it. I'm interested if the anyone listening to this has a perspective too. Yeah. Because I think we're just one of those, like, instead of just throwing the baby out with the bathwater, it's like, oh, funnels are stupid. It's more like, okay, this is like complex. But in some ways, you want to also use the terminology that some people are using, especially in mar- in a market, especially when you're a consultant. But also, you don't want a, people to make assumptions based on the terminology. That's why it's really hard for us, because in some ways, when you say, oh, I'm tracking a funnel, it's like, oh, everything starts at like known. And then mm-hmm. and it's like in some ways, but you can enter that uh, opportunity and we can still track back those stages. Um, also, to say that you don't need a measurement model at all in, in some ways like that, to me, is wrong because well, what about all of the, what about all the opportunities that sales created? Don't you want to actually know like what happened before that? Like if you're just tracking it for once it becomes an opportunity, like you're missing out on a big part of the picture. And like I said, it's even more useful this early. So, so yeah. yeah. Pipeline it is? For now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think we're, I think we're at the end of the the agenda yeah. here. So, um, yeah, thank you all for listening to this. I hope it was useful, insightful. Um, let us know if you have a question you want us to tackle in the third segment. We're going to be doing these you know, every week and breaking it down into these three segments where we go through the the breakdown, like one of the big things that we're seeing in our industry, the GTM or GTFO, where Chrissy or I are going to bring something for the other one to react to and say if we like it or not and then answer a question from the audience or something a question that we saw on LinkedIn or something maybe internally that our team team brought up. So yeah. hope you're enjoying it. Let us know, and we'll catch you on the next one.